Hello, this is Jonathan Miller for the Hometown Historian Channel. We are at the Fort Manada, Pennsylvania Historical Marker. In this vicinity stood James Brown's log house fort named Fort Manada when garrisoned as an outpost of Fort Swatera from January of 1756 to May 1757. Its usual complement consisted of 21 officers and men. No description of the fort has survived. And we will continue this here in a second. Thanks, everybody. Hi, everybody. Sorry about this. I tried to film at location at the Fort Manada historical marker. And it just did not work out. I didn't realize how windy it is yet today. So the audio quality was really bad. And I just, my hands get really bad with the fibromyalgia with any kind of breeze. You know, temperature isn't that bad, but with the wind being as severe, and it's right off of a golf course. I think it's Manada golf course. <coughs> it's just... It was brutal. So I tried to film in the van, and from the light shining, I didn't realize how much of a glare it was putting on the actual camera. So it sort of looked like crap. And I was like, you know what? We're going to redo this. We're going to start over. It's just not the way I would have liked to have filmed it, but it's just the way it's going to wind up having to be. Um, but anyways, so one of the things I had stated at the get-go when I did the filming before is on the marker it talks about the Fort Manada being Brown's Fort or James Brown's log house. Actually, it wasn't. The marker is actually wrong, uh, which is understandable because there's two types of thoughts. Uh, one, there were two separate forts, and one, the other one, would be that Brown's Fort would eventually, because a number of the settlers had created sort of, in essence, their own forts, and they usually had the name of the homeowner, that type of stuff. Fort Swatera, for instance, was originally Peter Hetrick's home and then wound up being a commissioned fort. He was part major part of the militia and they uh, enlarged it, made it into more of a blockade type style house. Sort of was elongated, usually had like two floors uh, and then had a palisade around the house for defensive purposes. They made it larger mainly to be able to house the militia and have it as more of a, a barracks building, if you will. Um, there's actually three forts in the area of Brown's Fort and Manada Fort. The third fort was called Robinson's Mill Fort. And I actually found a picture of a map that has where Robinson's Mill Fort was actually right up in the Manada Gap. It's sort of like the Blue Mountain comes down on either side and the Manada Creek goes in between. It's actually, I don't want to say it's a less pronounced gap, but it's sort of a lower part of the Blue Mountain. It's not like where the Swatera Gap, the mountains come together, and it, it's it's a pretty impressive gap. This one, actually, when you come up on it, uh, it's not real impressive, but it's it's still a gap, and it's still a pathway through the mountain chain and uh, was made for easy access for the Native American raiding parties. Uh, but the Robinson's Mill, I guess, was right on the creek, on the Manada Creek, and uh, they called it Robinson's Mill Fort, which I think more than anything, it was probably, even though uh, Fort Manada was considered an outpost of Fort Swatera, because Fort Swatera, Fort Hunter, which was down towards the Susquehanna, and Fort Henry, which guarded the Tulpahawken Path, those were like the main commissioned forts, like right in that, that chain there, if you will, along the Blue Mountain. Uh, but there were other forts along there. Uh, Fort, <coughs> excuse me, Fort Manada was the only one that I know of that was commissioned because they had Barnett's Fort was actually maybe about five to ten miles west of there towards Lingletstown. That was another one of those where it was someone's home, and uh, you know it was it was one of the guys usually a militia captain, and he'd use that as his fort, maybe sometimes housing militia for a short period of time something of that nature. But with Brown's Fort, this was actually James Brown's log home. And the historical marker is placed nearest to that. Manada Fort, or Fort Manada, was actually southwest of there. Maybe half a mile to a mile is where it was. With a lot of those log forts, there's nothing left. I mean, Fort Swatera, we know exactly where that was. 
There is some stone yet from the original foundation, but that's basically it. Most of them, they were logged. They lasted until, like, say, 1850 at the longest, and then either at some point burnt down or were torn down, something of that nature. It's just the nature of log structures, uh, especially when they were places that probably took a beating and things of that nature. Now, Barnett's Fort actually lasted quite a while. I think it was in the teens or the 20s, 19 teens or 20s, that they actually tore it down, and Dauphin County Historical Society actually has a picture of it right before it was torn down. Uh, it was just one of those things, that, and where the marker is there on, I think, Route 39 and Piketown Road, which we'll visit at some point here in the near future, uh, it was right off of there, back in the field beyond that. So, uh, But there were three forts in the Fort Manita area, and, and, and most of those, like Harper's Fort, uh, Reed's Fort, and Reed's Fort did hold militia, but a lot of those they were basically places of refuge. I mean, maybe a couple militia would stay there from time to time, but more than anything, they were made for when the militia made you aware, hey, there's an attack coming. The settlers would all go to these, these places of refuge. And, and they also had places of sanctuary, like the churches, that they would gather, like Monroe Valley Chapel was a log structure at the time of the French and Indian War. Bethel Moravian uh, Church was also a log structure. Hill Lutheran Church, these were places, they were large, substantial structures uh, that the community would go to and defend themselves at those structures. These smaller structures that were, you know, at times referred to as forts, they were more for defensive uh, purposes, but they weren't actually sanctioned by, uh, at the time, the uh, col colonial government, which would have been a Quaker government in Philadelphia. And uh, it actually took quite a while to get these forts approved in the first place because the Quakers were pacifists. They didn't believe in warfare or fighting or things of that nature. They they felt that this could all be worked out and they could negotiate and it, it would all be okay and it just simply wasn't realistic. And uh, James Galbraith, who I think we've talked about in the past, like I don't think he, I visited his grave at the Derry Presbyterian Church, but he is buried there. There is a senior and a junior. I'm not sure which one is which, but he was an esquire. Uh, so he took care of the law practices, and he also notary and that type of stuff. But he would be the spokesperson for that area. And Derry at that time was known as Derry. Now it's Hershey. But uh, he actually contacted the colonial government of Pennsylvania, letting them know, hey, we're really struggling right now. We have these raids coming through the Man at a Gap right now. There's no defense there. If at the very least, if you can't create militia or a fort or something of that nature, can you at least fund us rifles or something so we can defend ourselves from these attacks? And he continuously uh, tried to speak on the behalf of the people of the Hanover Townships in that region and uh, Derry Township. Uh, Adam Reed had done much the same uh, from where he was, uh, and they constantly were contacting him and saying, hey, we need we need help. So eventually they did sanction these forts. Swatera would have been first because I think that was in 1755, and then Manada would have been an outpost of that. But Brown's Fort had stood before just as uh, sort of arranged by local, local militia that was already gathered. Uh, I've seen some reports in my research that they refer to him as Captain James Brown. And then in other reports, they don't talk about him being part of the militia, but I do very much believe he was part of the militia. Uh, so I can see also <laughs> where the confusion came in uh, because he actually was killed in a Native American raid. So there's some thought that after that raid that they wound up using his house and it became Fort Manita and sort of like Peter Hetrick's home for Fort Swatera. They just enlarged it and blockaded it, but there are maps out there that clearly show Fort Manita and Brown's Fort are two completely separate places. And they also had, like I said before, the Robinson's Mill Fort. But when James Galbraith continued to contact the colonial government and wasn't getting anywhere, John Elder, who was the pastor of Paxton uh, Presbyterian Church, he was also a pastor at Derry Presbyterian Church where James Galbraith went, 
he took it upon himself. He said, we need to defend ourselves. So he started to organize what were called the Paxton Rangers or the Paxton Riflemen. And they sort of went all along the Blue Mountain there, along these different Blue Mountain forts to protect and become, in essence, the official militia. Unfortunately, with riling people up, and which is understandable that there was a lot of anger and frustration from the communities there, you had what came out of it called the Paxton Boys. There was a slight bit of crossover. There's at least one or two names that are known that were both Paxton Boys and Paxton Rangers, and they sort of took it upon themselves to sort of take on Native Americans. Unfortunately, they decided to sort of redirect their anger and they attacked the Conestoga Indians, who was a small tribe, maybe 40 members, 50 at most. Wasn't very many. A lot of them were women, children, older folks. And they went with 50, 60 men to the Conestoga village and they massacred, I believe it was 14 Native Americans, 14 or 16. And it just brutally, brutally beat them and murdered them and tortured them. And they say that John Elder had spoke out against it, whether he was there at the event that actually happened or not. Nobody really knows for sure. Uh, but he is responsible for riling them up to the point where they chose to do something like that. Ultimately, they're responsible for their own actions, but there was some culpability there as well for John Elder. Unfortunately, the remaining Conestoga Indians... They wound out taking them to the Lancaster City Jail where they felt like it was a fortified structure that they would be protected because their lives were still under threat. The Paxton boys found out about that. They went to the Lancaster City Jail, threatened the jail keeper and his assistant. They sort of stepped aside for the value of their own lives. They pulled the Conestoga Indians, the remaining ones, out and murdered them as well. Now, there are some stories that maybe two or three of them escaped, whether that's true or not, but... Two massacres, you know, they happen on both sides. A lot of times you hear about, like, you know, I think the Newton, Newton Houghton or something like that massacre and things of that nature where you had the Native Americans came in, and, but there was, it was both sides. And in both cases, it was this redirected anger that, you know, was misdirected at people that were usually the innocents. And that's the French and Indian War that was especially prevalent. Uh, now, I want to do, do want to talk about. Uh, this event where James Brown was killed. He uh, had a wheat field, I guess, which was not far from there, but it was right towards the Man of the Gap. And, and at that time, because of the hostilities, it wasn't wise as a farmer to go out and try to farm your fields by yourself. So he requested some help from the militia. They came. It was probably eight to ten men, and three Native American warriors attacked them. It was a surprise attack. They killed the one corporal immediately. Uh, they had muskets, shot another soldier. It broke his arm. And in the melee, when as they fought back, the Native Americans retreated. In the chaos, they uh, wound up leaving James Brown behind, not realizing he had been shot. It probably had been killed at that point. But when they realized he wasn't with them, they went back. They found his body. He had been scalped. They took his, his coat his shoes and his rifle. And I'm assuming he was buried probably there on the spot. Uh, Cause I've looked through find a grave through all the local family farm plots and the local cemeteries. And I can't find him anywhere. And, and you know, at that time he might've been put in a family or a farm plot, but a lot of those have been lost. Uh, Cause there were a ton of them back then. Cause that's primarily in the frontier. That's all you had. And, you know, they were usually, they didn't have many, many people buried there, but a lot of times they were either field stones because the people didn't have the money to get markers made up. And, you know, they had made wood markers, and of course none of those are surviving anymore. So we'll probably never know where James Brown is buried, but uh, uh, they said he was a pretty, pretty neat guy, but unfortunately he met his doom in that regard. And uh, that's, like I said before, that's sort of why... Part of it is assumed that maybe Brown's fort is home since he was killed, that that then therefore became Fort Manita, but they were two wholly separate uh, places altogether. Reasonably close together, but on this map that I had, you can definitely, it's like almost like in a triangle, uh, where Brown's fort was a little bit east of the gap. Manita Gap was more in line 
with Robinson's Mill Fort, which was right right in the gap. A uh, few other things I want to note that I've talked about in previous videos. Uh, I talked about Indian Town having a fort. The more research I do, the more I have talked to Cliff about as well. I'm finding less and less chance that there was a fort. Part of that probably is because you had the Susquehannock uh, villages all in that area, which is why it was called Indian Town. You did have a couple forts there, like Reed's Fort, Harper's Fort, which were reasonably close to Indian Town Gap. Uh, it still stands the reason that there might have been a fort, but it was not a, an officially sanctioned fort like I had thought. So whether there was one there or not, really, I've seen things where people have said there was, but I've also haven't found a whole lot in writing that says there was definitely some kind of fort or place of refuge or whatever there. So who knows? I mean, there, there might have been something there because there was sort of a scattering of these uh, sort of places of refuge type forts as well all over the place is just uh, you know you, when you're talking about 250 to 300 years of time passing a lot of this stuff really does get lost because you think about like oral history is how a lot of stuff was passed on back then oral history usually only lasts about 100 years because people start to are doing that oral history and are like the second generation start passing away or have already passed away. And sometimes by the third generation, it just doesn't, doesn't continue. Um, and I think you look at with as well, even with written history, if there isn't a visual uh, aspect to that, sometimes the, the, the context is lost. And the same with you can have a visual, but if you don't have that the words with it to explain what this actually, the context of this picture is, it loses loses credibility as well, whether it's legit or not. And, and like I said, there is confusion on what is. I mean, you even have like a Pennsylvania historical marker, which doesn't have the information correct. Uh, but that is, uh, that's what happened there at Fort Manitor. One other thing I do want to note as well, I've talked about the French and Indian War happened in two, two pieces. I think the first one happened 55 to 58, it might have started a little earlier, but it was in that general region. And then the second one was like 62 to 65, I believe. I might have the dates wrong on that. The second one was called Pontiac's War. I had talked about the Lenape Indians in, in uh, quite a few times. And I said that they were probably involved with the second one. Actually, they were involved with the first one. And the Susquehannock, I'm not sure if they were involved with either parts of that French and Indian War because they were largely pretty peaceful and just sort of stayed out of it. Uh, the Lenape had a genuinely good reason for being pretty angry. They had originally been from Delaware. They lost their land there, came here, had quite a parcel of land that they called home. And uh, Conrad Weiser at the time was the individual who did a lot of the negotiating with these different Native American tribes. And he was dealing with the Iroquois nation because he felt that that was more essential to deal with them because of the issues of them being slightly more aggressive in the past and having pretty good relations with the Lenape to that point. And I don't know if he knew about it or not, but the British made an agreement with the Iroquois nation. To basically, the Iroquois nation sold the Lenape's land without telling them. Now, to Iroquois nation's credit, they didn't figure on the British being deceitful in the way that they were doing things. It was basically whatever ground you can cover in a certain amount of period of time, that'll go in the land deal. They didn't think it was going to be that much. They didn't realize the British were planning on running the entire way and running 24 hours a day. So they wound up getting a much larger parcel of land and actually got basically all the Lenape's land. And at that point, the Lenape had had enough, and then that's how they got talked into working with the French on the French French side in the French and Indian War. But uh, these forts were very essential. Like, you think about it, like 21 men for Manada Fort. You had nine men that basically stayed in that general vicinity and guarded Manada Gap. And then six men went to the east to to Swatera, Fort Swatera. And they met somewhere in there, but they patrol these areas to make sure if there's any raids and then they warn the settlers. And the other six would go west towards Fort Hunter. 
and, and these forts were usually spaced five to ten miles between each other. If you think these these war bands were probably not more than three to six uh, men, maybe ten men at most. It's near impossible. It's like it's like trying to find a needle in a hot haystack, trying to solve this. But they did they did sort of push back enough that it did protect the settlers, and eventually the hostilities were ended for a short period of time, and then they started up again for a different set of reasons, and uh, and then a lot of those forts came back into operation uh, for a period of time. So it was a pretty pretty nasty and horrible war, and uh, and really like an example of the James Brown situation, the Native Americans and the European settlers had two very completely different fighting styles, and it really sort of threw the European settlers because they were used used to the European, what would eventually become Napoleonic warfare, where you sort of marched in a line, cross a field, you had this honor system of how you fought. And the Native Americans were very smart. What we would call today maybe more guerrilla warfare, where you use the land to your advantage. And especially when you're at a disadvantage numbers-wise, which they were in most cases, they really used all those things to their advantage. They used surprise and and that type of stuff, and, and they were very, very intelligent in the way they did it, and they really uh, were tremendous warriors. So they really put a, a hurting, and especially in that regard. But in a lot of cases, they it was it was not a not a not a fun fun time for anybody. But uh, with that, I think I've given you all the information I intended on. There is it's weird because Fort Swatara, there's probably a little more known. But Fort Manitou's history is probably a little more interesting. Plus, you have those other forts and the, and, and the idea of not knowing one way or the other. And I did do this video again. I had filmed on location earlier today. Did not realize how windy it was going to be. And with it being a golf course, it's open. And it was just brutal. And like I said, I tried to film in a van. And, film in a van, and it was the glare was awful. So... This isn't the way I would have liked to do it, but I don't know whether today, tomorrow is going to be better than today. So I figured let's just get this done and we'll go from there because I want to get this video out because it's, it's a cool story and it's another cool place. But we want to visit some of these other places. Uh, I still want to go back. I want to get to those two stone forts because the only ones that really are remaining at this stage are the ones that are made of stone like Light's Fort or Zeller's Fort. Zeller's Fort's unique in that they recreated it exactly as it would have been back in the French and Indian War, which I'm really excited to take you there because it's a unique experience to be able to see something like that. Of sort of the normal forts, if you will, not not just... You know, and Zeller's Fort, I don't believe, was a commissioned fort. It was more the Zellers chose to make it. So it would be like Brown's Fort, something of that nature, or Harper's Fort, or Reed's Fort. So it's not as substantial of a building as, say, Fort Swatera would have been. Uh, Fort Manitou was slightly smaller, but still, and Fort Hunter would have been a larger one as well. Uh, Fort Henry, I'm not really certain on the size because I haven't done a lot of research on that one yet, but we will visit that site as well at some point. But as always, it's fun. I uh, love taking you along on these adventures and just learning things about these uh, different places. And we will see you all about town.